Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our HashiCorp Solutions Engineering Hangout hosted by Thomas Kula. Today, we're going to talk about HashiCorp Vault. Vault is built to manage secrets and protect data across dynamic infrastructure. Thomas is going to show how to move um, to short-lived dynamic database credentials provisioned by Vault to reduce security risk and accelerate application delivery. I also want to note that this Hangout is recorded and the recording will be made available after post-processing, usually within about a day or two. I'll email it out to all of you. The demo will be about 20 minutes and then we'll allow up to 30 minutes afterward for questions. So please go ahead and submit your questions throughout the demo um, through the GoToWebinar portal and then we will get to them at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Take it away, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Amanda. So again, I'm Thomas Kula, a senior solutions engineer with HashiCorp. And today I want to talk to you about how you can use HashiCorp Vault to secure databases with dynamic credentials. And just to kind of get us started, let's talk about where things were maybe five, 10 years ago, how more legacy infrastructure was created. On the screen, we've got an example of a, you know, kind of a classic multi-tier web application. So you've got some number of front ends and they all interact with a database, some sort of data store. And typically, you know, in the way we would traditionally do things, you'd have a relatively small number, relatively static uh, number of, of front ends. And so your database team would provision an account for that uh, that front end. They'd create a data or create a, a password, a username, set the grants appropriately, and then you would use that same kind of static shared credential against all of the instances of your uh, of that front end. That's got some challenges, however. Um, so that no longer scales to how we're running kind of modern infrastructure. Uh, we've moved away from having relatively static, relatively small number of pieces of infrastructure to using things like microservices. Uh, and so, you know, you may be running things in maybe an auto scaling group in, in uh, an EC2 instances, an Amazon or, or an Azure. Uh, you may be running things inside of a containerized environment. So you've gone from having, say, maybe five web front ends to having 50, 500, uh, 5,000. That number changes radically. So, you know, you'd say you're running during a normal day and your load goes up and so you start scaling the number of front ends uh, and then those front ends go away when the load goes back down. That number changes radically. The amount of pieces in the infrastructure changes radically. And so the lifetime of your secrets in your infrastructure no longer matches the lifetime of the components of your infrastructure. And that produces some challenges. Short-lived dynamic infrastructure shares long-lived static secrets. So the scope of that secret no longer matches the scope of the, the pieces of infrastructure that have to use those secrets. A secrets problem with one instance is a problem for all instances. Uh, so, you know, if you've got 500 instances of your web front end running inside of containers and you have a problem uh, where you have to rotate that database password, uh, that's, a, that's a, a, a huge problem because that affects every, it affects all 500 instances, for example, of your web front end. And rolling out secrets takes a long time, and this may be time that you don't have. So I often ask people who, uh, you know, work on infrastructure, who work on application stacks, you know, how many of us have accidentally pasted our, um, you know, our production database password into Slack, or you've accidentally committed it to, you know, a public GitHub repository. It's a very common thing. A lot of a lot of places have faced that. And so you have to rotate that credential quickly. Uh, and doing that when that affects all of those pieces of infrastructure takes a long time. And identifying the scope of our problems is a challenge. If your database team comes to you and says, hey, we've noticed some unusual data access, uh, but it's coming from your web front end. Well, you don't know which web front end. If you've got 500 and they're all sharing the same credential, you're not sure which one the problem stems from. So the challenge in the, we'd like to move to is to using dynamic secrets. And a dynamic secret is a short-lived per instance credential. It is generated when the need for it comes for the piece of infrastructure that needs it. Uh, and the secrets lifetime matches the instance lifetime. Let's say those example containers only last for eight hours. Uh, the secret for that, uh, that, that container should also only last for eight hours. 
A problem in a single instance affects only that instance. And the example I like to give is, let's say you're rolling out a new version of uh, that web front end, you're rolling out some new containers and you push out that, you know, that first canary instance of the new one. Uh, and you notice, hey, we accidentally left debug mode turned on that container and it logged its database credentials to our logging infrastructure. Now we've got to change that password. Uh, that only affects that single instance. All other instances have their own unique credentials, their own unique username and password, uh, and so they're not affected at all. And discovering the scope of problems is much easier. If your database team comes to you and say, we've noticed some unusual data access patterns, here's the username, you can go back through the audit logs in Vault and say, okay, that dynamic user was was provisioned to this container. It was valid from this time to this time, and it much more easily allows you to discover the scope of those problems. And so, I want to start off by just showing a demo uh, of some of uh, you know some of the features that you'd use with dynamic database credentials. So, I'm going to switch my window over here uh, to a, a machine. Now, uh, I've got a set of scripts that I've ran or that I'm running to go through the demos. It's going to show a lot of what's happening on screen. These are all going to be available in a public GitHub repository shortly after uh, this presentation gets out. We'll make sure that you've got a link to that. It was in the uh, the beginning slide uh, as well. So you'll be able to download the exact scripts that I'm running and follow along for yourself if you want to try this out. I've done a little bit of preparatory work. So I've got a machine. I've got a running uh, MySQL database uh, loaded with some sample data. And I've got a Vault dev instance running. So the first thing I'm going to do is to set up the database secrets engine in Vault. Every kind of secret in Vault is handled through a secrets engine, uh, and database secrets are, are no different. And so what I've done here is I've told Vault that we're going to be provisioning dynamic database credentials. And this just simply makes that, that plugin available to Vault. And now we're going to do some configuration. The first thing we want to do is configure a connection to the database that we want to manage. So in this screen, what you're seeing is a command that you might run where I'm going to create a database configuration for this example database. Uh, I'm going to say this is a MySQL database. And then I'm giving it some normal kind of configuration. Here's the conf connection URL that you'll use to connect to it. Um, I'm going to create a, a username and password. Um, and this is what Vault itself will use when it needs to connect to the database and to provision users and set grants. This bottom line here, we're saying the roles that are allowed to access this database connection. And let's talk about what those roles are. A database role inside of the Vault's uh, database secrets engine is really just a collection of uh, grants that you want to provision um, for a particular piece of your infrastructure. So in this example here, we're creating an admin role. Uh, perhaps this is something that uh, you've got an administrative instance uh, that you want to run, or maybe you want to be able to provision short-lived dynamic credentials for uh, your development team or your operations team to be able to connect to the database and run kind of administrative statements. So we're creating a role in Vault um, called admin. Uh, we're telling it the database that we're using. We're doing things like saying, what's the default time to live and maximum time to live for the secrets generated by this? And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, we've got creation statements. Uh, and I've pulled those out down here at the bottom to kind of highlight them. When you create a dynamic database user with Vault, it generates a random username and password. It connects to the database um, using its administrative credentials, and then it runs whatever creation statements you've configured. Uh, and so a very common one is to create the user. These values in the double curly brackets, the name and the password, are replaced by the values that Vault dynamically generates. So here, we're creating a user in the MySQL database. We're setting its password. And then we're writing some grant statements. Uh, so this is an admin role. So we're granting all privileges on this particular database to this dynamic user that we've created. As another example, let's say you've got some sort of back-end piece of your infrastructure, some sort of back-end uh, container, back-end uh, application, um, and it needs to have kind of different credentials. And so we've created a different role. We've created a back-end role. 
still connecting to the same database. We've changed the default and maximum TTL to kind of match the expected lifetime that we would have. So let's say perhaps this is a, a, a container that goes out, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe you deploy it once a week, and so you give it enough time to last for, you know, a week uh, or, or, or whatnot. And then we've got a different set of creation statements. So here, the same statement, the creating the user looks the same, but here we've used a different grant statement. So we've given this role the ability to do, you know, kind of your, your general CRUD um, roles on a database, but not to have any kind of administrative rights on that database. And you can put any number of creation statements in here to, to tailor this particular role to what that role needs to do in your database. Now we want to tie this together and govern who can ask Vault for those kind of dynamic credentials. And everything in Vault, Vault is, a, is, is accessed through a RESTful API, so everything happens through a, a URL path. Uh, and there are policies in Vault that say who's allowed to perform what operations on what paths. And here we've got an example policy for our admin user. Uh, this first bit is the kind of the key point. In order to read or to get a new database credential for the admin role, uh, it's going to read this path. And so we've said if you are a user or uh, an entity, you know, some sort of piece of infrastructure that has authenticated to Vault and you have this admin policy, you're allowed to read the admin credentials. And here we've uploaded that policy. Same thing for the back end. So we've said, okay, if you have a if you have authenticated to Vault and you have a back end credential or back end role, you're allowed to call this to generate new credentials for the back end. Let's take a look now at how those are enforced. So just show some basic credential usage. So you know, for the demo here, I'm just doing a very simple. I'm just generating a token directly that has the admin policy applied to it. So I've created a new token. You can see down here that one of the policies is the admin policy. And I can use that to fetch some database credentials. And so this is what you might do with the vault command line tool to fetch some admin credentials. And because I'm running this with a token that has the admin policy, I'm allowed to call this path. And what vault has done here is it has gone out, it has generated this random username, it has generated this random password, it has connected to the database, created that user and ran the grant statements that we defined as part of the role. And now we'll try those credentials out. So we use the MySQL command line client to connect using the username and password that we just created. And we can see that when we ask MySQL for the grants, we can see that we have the grants that we expect for an administrative user on this database. Now, I mentioned earlier that every secret in Vault has a lifetime associated with it. Uh, and so what we're doing here is we're revoking our token. This might be something that uh, your piece of your infrastructure might do when it shuts down to kind of clean up after itself. Uh, so what I've done here, this, this Vault command, is I've said, I'm now done with these credentials. Go ahead and revoke it. And Vault not only gets rid of that token, but it also removes any dynamic secrets that that token and created. And so we can see now, I try to connect with the exact same username and password that I had previously used to connect to the database, but I'm no longer able to access that database. So Vault is not only just not providing you the ability to see the username and password it generated, it has actually gone out to the database and it has deleted that user um, so that, that that user, that dynamic user, no longer has access. <clears throat> I'm going to do the same thing for the backend policy, but so far we've been making use of the Vault command line tool. Let's make use of Vault's RESTful API. So I've got a little JSON document here that says I want to generate a new token with uh, this particular backend policy. And I'm making a curl call. Uh, this just to, you know, to kind of demonstrate how to use this. You could do this from pretty much any programming language that has a, a RESTful API library. And, and basically every programming language this day has that. Um, and several programming languages have Vault helper libraries that kind of simplify access to Vault. So I'm just making a call to create a new token. Uh, and I get back a JSON document that's got my token in it. And you can see I've got the backend policy. Uh, and now when I um, connect to that or, or ask for a set of credentials, 
I get those credentials back. And again, I've got the same username. I got password that's been generated dynamically. I can connect to the database. And here, because we've connected as a back end, we've got a different set of grants. So this is the set of grants that we created uh, in the creation statement when we define the role in Vault. And so we've got the access that we expect. Uh, I can also, same thing again, revoke my token and that cleans up the secrets. And now I can no longer connect. Now I want to show you policy enforcement. So verifying or to demonstrate to you that uh, if you've got one set of policy in Vault, you're only allowed to do what the policy in Vault says you're allowed to do. So again, I'm creating a token with the admin policy attached to it. I'm going to use it to try to fetch backend credentials. Uh, and because the policy does not allow an admin user to create to fetch backend credentials, I can know I can't actually access that when I try to do that in Vault, I get a permission denied. And it works the same way. I'm going to create a policy or a token with this backend policy uh, and try to use Vault to get administrative credentials. And again, I try to read admin credentials, and I'm not allowed to do that in Vault because my policies associated with my token don't allow me to do that. So you can enforce access control to who's allowed to generate what kind of secrets uh, in your infrastructure with Vault. Now, so far we've been using the Vault command line tool. We've been making direct RESTful API calls to interact with Vault. And that's great if you're if you're writing, maybe you've got some greenfield projects or you're able to, to spend the effort to make your application or your infrastructure interact directly with Vault. But in a lot of cases, you've got existing infrastructure that you know you just uh, you don't have the time right at this point, um, or or uh, you know, you've got other pressing needs um, and, and can't rewrite your your infrastructure, your application, interact directly with Vault. Uh, we provide a couple of tools that help you facilitate that. The first tool I'm going to talk about, or the tool I'm going to talk about today is called Console Template. Uh, now, as you might guess from the name, Console Template allows you to interact with HashiCorp's console, but it also allows you to interact with Vault. Uh, and what that does is you provide Console Template with some sort of template, for example, like this one. And here, you know, I've got a template. Maybe it's reading a couple of environment variables. Uh, here, it's talking to a Vault server, and it's asking for a particular set of backend credentials. And then it's going to use those credentials. So it's going to replace this uh, bit here inside the double curly brackets with the username that's generated, with the password that's generated, and with a particular lease ID that's generated. And if we run that, so we'll run it once to generate a MySQL defaults file. Uh, using you know the example here that, that you see on the screen, you'll get back something that looks like this. And this looks like a regular MySQL, you know, my.comp file um, that you might provide to uh, a piece of your infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, it's got a host name and a port, but it's also got this dynamic username and password that Vault has generated. And so this allows you to, you know, have some helpers to come along, uh, but really all they're doing is, is writing out configuration configuration file. So your existing application, pretty much any application, uh, any library that's interacting with MySQL, you can simply point it at that file and it will have the credentials that it needs to access the database. Uh, the application doesn't know that that dynamic secret came from Vault. So as far as it's concerned, it's just reading its configuration file. Uh, but you've used console template as a helper uh, to generate that con or that template file, to generate that configuration file dynamically. There's a, a similar application called EnvConsole, which does, which works actually very much the same way, but instead of writing out a configuration file, it sets environment variables. And so if you've got a 12-factor uh, application where it reads all of its configuration from environment variables, you can wrap it with EnvConsole and have EnvConsole pull out secrets for you and set them in environment variables. Uh, so that gives you, uh, you know, a, a lot of, of very easy ways of integrating, uh, interacting with Vault into your infrastructure, all the way from, you know, still able to use legacy applications, um, just helping them out by generating configuration files, all the way to being able to, you know, interact with Vault directly uh, using perhaps a RESTful API call, uh, a RESTful API library or a Vault library. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about lease expiration. 
So as I said earlier, every secret in Vault has a lifetime associated with it. Uh, it's got a lease. Uh, and when that lease expires, the credential gets cleaned up automatically. But you could do other things with the lease that will help you react to problems uh, in your infrastructure. So here, for an example, I've generated three credentials files with console template. And three is just easy for this demo. You can see it all on one screen. But this easily could be 50 or 500 uh, different credentials files spread out across your application. So I've generated three credentials files. I connect to our MySQL database, and I can see I've got three uh, unique users, as I would expect at this point. Uh, and verify, I can use all three of those files. So you can see I can connect uh, with back in zero, back in one, back in two. They've all got different or distinct usernames, but they've got the exact same access on the database. So, you know, this is also an important thing to note that even though each of the pieces of your infrastructure has dynamic usernames and passwords or distinct usernames and passwords, they've all got the exact same access to the database. Now let's say, you know, using my example earlier, you start a rolling deployment of a new backend, you push out your first kind of canary instance, and you see that it starts logging its database credentials into your logging setup. You've accidentally left debug mode turned on in that container. Um, now, if you didn't have dynamic credentials, if you had rolled out, say, 50 instances of this and they were all sharing the exact same username and password, um, you would have to revoke that for all instances. And so you'd have the problem of coordinating, generating a new credential, getting it distributed out, getting it pushed out, rolling out new pieces of infrastructure that use those new credentials. But here with dynamic credentials, handling this is easy because you only need to revoke a single isolated credential. So let's say it's in the instance with the, uh, the backend number two configuration. We've logged the lease ID and it's uh, generated configuration file. So down here at the bottom of this dynamic credential, uh, we've got a lease ID. And we can use that in Vault to revoke those credentials. Uh, so, so an administrative user or someone with the appropriate access in Vault can say, revoke this lease. And what that does is Again, much like if it had expired naturally, um, or if you'd you know, said, I'm done with those credentials, Vault goes out, connects to the database, and deprovisions those credentials. So let's see what happened. I can still connect you know, back in zero and back in one. They are still able to connect just fine. They're completely isolated credentials. They've got their own username, their own password. They're still functioning as you would expect. Uh, but number two, the one that had problems, no longer has access. Uh, so that configuration, those credentials are no longer usable. And so what you've done is you've reacted to an incident uh, or a problem with a single instance of your infrastructure and your, your reaction, your, your handling of that only affected that single instance. The rest of your infrastructure is still operating normally. Uh, and we can verify that that user, you know, that was in our configuration file, no longer exists on the database. So again, Vault has actually gone to the database and it has deleted that user from the database. Finally, you know, let's say your security team has found some sort of exploit in your backend code, and you need to do an emergency revocation of all of your backend database credentials. This is some sort of, you know, break glass kind of operation. We can revoke credentials or revoke leases based on a prefix. So all of the credentials for the backend will have this prefix. So we just told Vault to re or revoke all of the credentials that start with that prefix. And now let's see what happened. Now all instances uh, you know, immediately stop working. Uh, none of them are usable now. Uh, and again, if we connect to the database, here are the usernames that we had previously provisioned. None of those exist in the database anymore. Uh, so what this demonstrates is you've got the ability, you've got the flexibility to tailor your reaction to a problem, to the scope of the problem. You're no longer fixed to, oh, we've got a, a shared database credential used across all of our infrastructure, and so a problem with any one piece now affects all of them. Instead, with Vault and dynamic database credentials, you've moved to the point where you've got a, uh, you know, per instance, provisioned just on demand credentials and a problem with a particular piece of that infrastructure, you know, the reaction only affects that. And you can scale it to, to you know, meet the kind of the scale of, of your problem instead of being forced to revoke it for all of your infrastructure. 
And so that concludes our, our demonstration. Like I said earlier, uh, the code for all of the scripts that I ran will be posted to a public GitHub repository shortly after the end of this presentation. So you can go and download the scripts, follow along, and see the exact commands that I ran to, to do this demo. Uh, and with that, I think I'll turn it back to Amanda for some, some questions. Thanks, Thomas. Um, okay, so great demo. So we have a few questions coming in. So a reminder to everyone, if you have questions that came up, go ahead and enter them in the portal and um, we will ask them, we'll get to them. So first question, Thomas, someone's wondering what databases um, does Vault work with besides uh, MySQL? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I, I fortunately I have that uh, our website up so that you can see that or so that I can see that. So Vault works with several popular databases. So it works with MySQL and MariaDB, as you've seen here in this demo. Uh, it works with PostgreSQL, Oracle. Um, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, you can provision credentials for MongoDB, HANADB, InfluxDB, uh, and Cassandra. Uh, and because all of these operations, because all these secrets engines are pluggable, uh, if you've got some sort of unique um, you know, database or unique system that you need to generate dynamic credentials for, it's relatively easy if you've got some Golang programming experience to write a custom plugin uh, to meet your your exact needs, but out of the box, you've got support for those kind of very common uh, databases. Great. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Um, so next question, someone's asking, how many requests can a single vault ser server handle? Um, you know, we you know it's it's uh, you know appropriately sized. Um, you know, so you're running your vault server on appropriately sized, you know, either let's say a, a VM or an EC2 instance or an Azure, um, you know, virtual machine. Vault can handle, you know, quite a lot of, of operations per second. Um, now, of course, when you're interacting with dynamic database credentials, it, it also depends kind of on the, the speed of your database as well, because every dynamic credential that you're creating, Vault has to you know, talk to the database and provision the user there as well. So, you know, that can be a, a gate to your speed, but, you know, it, it's not unheard for us to have customers who uh, are, you know, doing, you know, several thousands or even several tens of thousands of operations with Vault per second, uh, you know, assuming that, you know, you've, you've sized the, 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 uh, the instance that it's running on appropriately, you've got appropriate network, your database responds uh, quickly enough. Um, so it, that's, it's a, it's a pretty fast system. Awesome. Okay. So now, um, how does Vault know the application should have access to the specific policy you assign it to? That's also a good question. So in this demo, you know, I've kind of faked it, you know, just to, to show for the demo, um, you know, and I was generating tokens dynamically. So I was running with some Vault, uh, some root credentials, and I was generating tokens. There are multiple ways that you can authenticate to the Vault server. And this is kind of the power of using Vault in, in different kind of cloud environments and a multi cloud environment or combining cloud and on-premise infrastructure. Uh, you can authenticate to Vault in several different ways. So let's say you're running inside of a Kubernetes cluster um, and, and your pod your pod is going to have a, a Kubernetes JOT associated with it. Uh, Vault can use that JOT to you know, know, okay, what service principle or uh, I forget what the the other thing like service role that that container that particular pod is running with, and you can map those different things to different policies. So if you're if you're running a pod that's got a certain service principle or certain service policy associated with it, you can tell Vault that oh this one maps to our back end policy. Uh, you can authenticate if you're running inside of a uh, Inside of an Amazon uh, uh, EC2 instance, you can authenticate with an IAM role, uh, and that IAM role vault can verify, oh, this is an EC2 instance that started with this particular role, and that role is mapped back to that back end policy. Uh, same thing, for example, with, with Azure. So you can start up a VM in Azure with a managed service identity, or I think they've changed the name of that, but the, the concept's the same. Uh, and again, Vault can you know, get information, okay, what, you know, what service identity is this running with, or what resource group is this running in, and make decisions based on that. What that allows you to do is to leverage the trusted authentication mechanisms um, that you, you've already got in your environment, be it in a Kubernetes cluster, in, in Amazon, or you 
uh, Azure, Google Compute, um, you know, on-premise. There's, there's multiple different ways you can authenticate, but you tie each of those different authentications back to a certain set of policies. So much like when I manually generated a credential and said, this is going to have the back-end policy, you would configure, you know, those individual authentication mechanisms to say, oh, you know, when you authenticate this way and you've got you know, this role or this service identity uh, associated with it, it maps to this policy, Vault gives back a token that has that policy associated with it. The nice thing about that is it doesn't matter where you're running your infrastructure. You can kind of run the same application uh, in uh, an on-premise Kubernetes cluster. You can run it uh, in, in Amazon or in Azure or in Google Compute, any of the popular clouds. You'll authenticate differently but once you've authenticated and you get a vault token back, those tokens can have the exact same policies mapped to it. So it doesn't matter where your infrastructure is running, as long as you've configured it properly, those, uh, those policies govern what that application is allowed to do in Vault. And they're all interacting with Vault in the same way. So they're making RESTful API calls or using a Vault library. Uh, so it really simplifies deploying your infrastructure you know, in multiple clouds or in on premise and in clouds as well. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. So now someone's wondering, they, they're asking if I set uh, the TDL of a secret to 30 days, can mm -hmm. multiple read calls get the same credential for those 30 days? Or will it uh, will it always be a new credential generated through the SQL query provided? Uh, it'll always be a, 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 a new dynamic credential. So if you if you make a call to Vault and say, you know, if you do a read, say, give me a, a you know, a, a backend database credential, Vault is going to generate a new credential every time. And that's, you know, that that fits with our model, you know, our goal of, you know, each of the pieces of your infrastructure should have dynamic credentials. So it should have its own unique credentials because you get a lot of the strengths out of that. But if you're running in an environment where, you know, you don't want to do that, um, you know, you, you, can, you can make a single call. You just have to figure out how to distribute those secrets to those pieces of infrastructure that need to share it. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's capable of doing that. You can't do that directly with Vault. You can build some tooling around it to kind of meet your workflow. Uh, but again, you know, like I demonstrated uh, here, you know, that, that comes with some, some drawbacks as well. So if you're sharing those credentials, it's harder to react to a problem with one of those credentials. Uh, but if you're running in a kind of environment where, say, you're, you know, you've got licensing uh, problems with your database where you can only have a certain number of users, you know, I, yeah, I could see where you might uh, need to be able to do that. Um, um, you can't right now with Vault do that dynamically. You'd have to kind of put some tooling around it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then the next question. Um, so they're asking. Um, they're saying, "Does let me make sure I get this right." But um, they're saying, "Does Vault uh, maintain state as in if a if the account is removed manually in a DB, will it recreate it?" Um, um, Vault. Yeah. So so Vault. Vault maintains state in that when you create a credential in Vault, it you know it's got its lease associated with it. It knows what token um, you know was created with it, and so it'll do all of its cleanup. But it doesn't you know it it's assuming that it's the only one managing those particular credentials. So if you provision a credential through Vault and then you go into the database directly and delete that user, um, Vault won't recreate that user. Um, and in fact, Vault won't even talk to the database for that particular user until it needs to remove that user. Um, okay. so, um, so let me then make sure that maybe I've gotten just answered, Thomas, to be yeah. sure. So then they said also the other side, if Vault gets restarted, mm -hmm. assuming unclean, no HA scenario, will it remember about accounts it's created and be able to remove accounts from the DB when they expire. Yes, yes. So if, if you're running Vault, um, you know, if you're running Vault with, you know, in anything outside of dev mode, so you've got persistent state um, and you're, you know, especially if you're running in an HA mode using like say console uh, as your your state backend, every secret you generate, all, all of those leases. So when it when you when you authenticate that token lifetime, that's persisted to Vault's underlying storage. When you um, when you create a dynamic secret, you know, information about that secret, its lease ID and, and what Vault needs to do to clean it up is also persistent to Vault's backend storage. And so if, you know, you created a bunch of credentials and then shut down your entire Vault 
cluster and then restarted it, Vault has all of that state uh, and will be able to go out and, and do cleanup uh, as expected. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And now, um, so this is interesting. Someone's uh, saying how they're considering uh, Kubernetes and Vault integration. So mm -hmm. they're kind of starting to look at, you know, best practices around that. Um, and they're asking, would you run Vault within the cluster that's using it? Or would you rather provision it elsewhere? Um, you know, I, I usually, I mean, it's, it's perfectly, you're perfectly able to run Vault inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And in fact, you know, we're in the process of publishing some guidance about how you might reliably run Vault inside of a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, late last year, we started publishing a bunch of, of uh, you know, guidance documents on doing the same thing for running a console cluster inside of a Kubernetes cluster. We're working on the same sort of guidance for running Vault inside of a Kubernetes cluster. So if you're running in an environment where you, you know, that's where you, um, you know, that's where you're running all of your infrastructure, you know, it's perfectly fine to do that. You know, you, of course, you've got to have, you know, Vault needs to have persistent back in storage. So if you're, you know, if you're using console as it's back in store, you know, console needs to be able to persist stuff on disk and, and not have that, you know, go away if the console, you know, pod moves around or whatnot. Um, the only thing I always caution um, is, you know, just make sure if you're using Vault to provision secrets that allow you to administrate the Kubernetes cluster that Vault is running in, you know, you've got kind of a circular problem there. Um, so, you know, make sure that, you know, if 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 Vault is somehow in the workflow for administering the Kubernetes cluster it's running in, that you've got additional ways of authenticating the cluster or, or you know, generating secrets or whatnot, uh, just so you don't get into that kind of, you know, uh, you know, chicken and egg kind of scenario where, you know, your Kubernetes cluster goes down, and so your Vault cluster goes down, and because your Vault cluster is down, you can't generate the secrets that you need to administer the Kubernetes cluster that Vault runs in, if, if that uh, makes sense. Right, yeah, yeah, thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so for the person who's asking about that, stay stay tuned, those get posted. Thomas, those get posted on our blog on our website, right, once it gets published, that's where the Yeah, is. yeah, so so we, we tend to publish blog entries for that. Uh, if you go to hashicorp.com slash resources, there's a lot of resources that show up there uh, as well. And if you check out the Vault website uh, at vaultproject.io, you know, those, those tend to up there as well. So there's there's a couple of different ways you can find them. But certainly, you know, as we're releasing that, we're publishing blog posts about them. They'll show up in our resources library as well. Great. Okay. And then um, you started to kind of touch on this in the last one, I think. So if someone's asking, um, where does Vault store data? Sure. Um, so Vault has a, a number of backends that it can use to persist data. Um, and some of them allow Vault to run in a high availability mode. Some of them don't. Um, so for example, in this demo, I was running a Vault cluster in dev mode. Uh, and what that does is that, that just stores its, its data in memory. Uh, and so when I shut it down, all of the configuration, all the data goes away. And that's really, that's just useful for things like development or, or doing demos. Uh, the, the recommended backend for Vault is to use HashiCorp console um, to store its data. And so when you have a console cluster, uh, console is a highly available key value store um, with uh, service, uh, service segmentation, service discovery built into that. When you use that mm -hmm. as Vault's backing store, um, you get things like it, it coordinates, you know, having a vault cluster, so you can do high availability. It stores its data in the console key value store. Um, so that's one way of doing it, and certainly the one that we recommend. But we've got a, a bunch of different backends that you can use. So you can use, um, you know, you can use console, you can use, um, you know, etcd, you can use, um, you know, some of the uh, like DynamoDB. There's there's a bunch of different backends, and, and a lot of stuff in Vault, and and so many of our tools is pluggable. Uh, so you know, we've got recommendations for certain things, but you know, our philosophy at HashiCorp is to make sure that our tools work with your workflow. So we don't want to come in and mandate that you have to use a particular tool um, to use our infrastructure or to use our tools. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different um, backends that, that Vault can use to, to store its data. And with some of those backends, um, they've got the capabilities that allow you to run Vault in high availability mode. So you could have multiple Vault servers in a single cluster. So you've got failover in the event that one of them fails. Cool. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. And we've got, it looks like two more questions. So if anyone else has kind of been waiting, go ahead and enter it now so that we get to it. Um, so Thomas, uh, someone's asking, are the credentials you provided to Vault 
at the beginning um, to connect to the database also dynamic? Um, so those those are static, uh, and so what you know, and that's that's kind of your bootstrapping mode. So you need to give Vault credentials that it can use to connect to the database um, and and provision users and passwords. Um, so you know, your your kind of your first step is you need to go into the database manually create that that username and password, uh, give it the appropriate grants to be able to create new users to set grants to you know basically run anything that are going to be in your create statements now there is a feature inside of vault that allows you to rotate those root credentials and so what you can do is you you know you have to manually set up some credentials in in your database you give those to vault vault can then rotate those credentials so what it'll do is it will generate its own dynamic username and password it will connect to the database um, will create that user will set up the grants appropriately and then it'll delete the credentials that you gave it uh, to begin with uh, and that gives you the nice feature that you know the credentials that vault needs to use to connect to the database you know they're not something that you had to copy and paste so you don't have to worry okay is this sitting in a file somewhere did i email it uh, or whatnot those credentials are gone uh, and the secret the the password that vault needs to use to connect to the database exists only inside of vault's cryptographic barrier and you, and you can't get it back out but you know to kind of start everything off to kind of bootstrap everything you've got to create uh, you know manually create a, a username and password with the appropriate rights inside of vault but once you done that that's that's kind of the last one you have to do you can use vault to provision all other credentials from that great okay thank you um and then uh, someone's asking um does vault change its credentials for vault agent um when you say changes credentials for vault i'm not quite sure um, you know, just just to clarify for folks who may not know, Vault Agent uh, is a helper in the Vault command line tool that uh, allows you to do things like kind of automate that initial authentication. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's got helpers to say, you know, if you're running inside of a uh, uh, EC2 instance, you can tell Vault Agent to start up to do the appropriate thing to authenticate using uh, an IAM role, uh, and then write that token out somewhere so that other pieces of in, or you know code on that that instance can can read it um, vault agent will handle things like you know doing you know kind of renewing credentials you know so if you if you authenticate uh, and you know you hand out an eight hour credential but you've got a maximum lifetime that allows you to do that vault agent can keep renewing those credentials for you um, so maybe maybe that answered what the uh, what the question was was asking if, if not you know just kind of clarify what you were asking. Okay, yeah, and they didn't, that was all they said, but if the person's oh. still on the line, um, if you wanna clarify, if, if, the, if that didn't answer it, go ahead and clarify and we can yeah. come back to it. So, yeah. uh, okay, last question. So, sure. um, Thomas, someone's asking, is it possible to set up dyna a dyna dynamic database credentials in the UI, or is it only possible to set this up in the CLI? Uh, you, can, you can also do it in the UI. So, for, for those of you who aren't aware, I, I didn't show it at all in the demo, but Vault, open source, and enterprise comes with a UI now. Uh, and you can, you know, you can, you know, UI, you know, it's, it's a web UI. So, you go to a web page, you authenticate to it, um, you know, really designed to make it easy for, for people to interact with Vault. You can generate dynamic credentials that way. Um, you know, so you just have to, you know, click through to the appropriate place uh, and say generate a dynamic credential and you'll get it back. And that's really great for, you know, as I showed the, for example, the the admin role uh, in the demo, um, you know, and I said that a use for this might be, you know, having your operations team or your database team um, be able to generate dynamic credentials to connect to the database and do administrative stuff. One way that they could do that is someone on that team could log into the vault UI go to the appropriate place and say, oh, I need an admin credential, click the button to generate it. As long as they've got the proper policy associated with their account, they'll be able to generate those credentials and it'll just show up you know, on the web page and, and then they can use them. Uh, they can also go in and, and revoke those credentials when they're done with them or you know, clean them up uh, if necessary. So yeah, pretty much everything that is capable, you know, at, at, at its base, all interactions with Vault go through Vault's RESTful API. Um, 
But everything you can do through Vault's RESTful API, you can also do through Vault's command line tool. And all the command line tool is doing is making RESTful API calls. And the same thing with the Vault web UI. Everything, you know, you can do all of those operations inside of the web UI as well. Underneath the covers, it's just making RESTful API calls. So, you know, both the command line and the web UI, they don't have any kind of secret, you know, SDK that they're using to talk to Vault. They're using the exact same RESTful API calls that uh, everything else does. So there's nothing secret or hidden there, but you, you've got the flexibility to use either the RESTful API, to use the command line tool, or to use the, the, the web UI. Cool, okay, great. Um, awesome, then I think that wraps things up. So thank you so much, Thomas, for coming through those. That's a great, yeah. lots of clarification. Yeah. And um, thanks everyone for, for showing up today uh, and asking great questions. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, this Hangout was recorded, so we'll make it available on our website in that resources page that Thomas mentioned um, after processing. I'll send an email to everyone who registered with that recording link. Um, also, if you liked what you heard today and you want to start exploring Vault a bit more, I encourage you to check out our new Learn site. We recently launched this for each of our products, and you can find it on our website. Also, you can go directly there through learn.hashicorp.com slash Vault. So I hope you all enjoyed today's Hangout and have a better understanding of Vault's dynamic credentials capabilities. Um, thanks for hanging out with us today, and big thank you to Thomas for his time today. Yeah, that thanks, everyone. Us. Yeah. And have a great rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone.